Hey, what's up everybody? Today we are going to talk about the Focal Evo X number no. two. These speakers were loaned to me by the manufacturer and they retail for about $5,200 per pair. Now, as you can see here, I've got this dark green color and that's the color that I actually requested myself because I think it just looks great. Some quick specs. This is a three-way design. It features a six and a half inch flax mid-range driver, dual six and a half inch mid-base drivers, and an aluminum magnesium combination inverted dome tweeter with a relatively mild waveguide. There's a single pair of binding posts on the back. Recommended power is 40 to 250 watts. Sensitivity is stated at 91 and a half decibels. Height is about 41 inches tall and weight is about 55 pounds each. They come with a plinth on the bottom that bolts into it and that allows you to raise the bottom of the speaker off the floor and then that has a port underneath the speaker. So it gives you a little bit of clearance for that port. Don't think that you can set these right on the floor. You have to use that plinth. In terms of overall sound quality, I liked the mid-range and the bass, but I did not like the highs. Now to no real surprise, I found the highs were just too bright. Most of the Focal speakers that I've listened to in the past 10, 15, or even 20 years, if you're going back to the car audio days, uh, I tend to find their tweeter level just more than I would want. Now with these speakers set up in my living room, I had about three feet of distance between the back of the speaker to the front wall behind it. And I played around with toe in and toe out. Initially, I started out with the speaker directly pointed at me, so significant toe in. Uh, the, the tweeter was just too bright. So then I wound up towing it out some and I wound up landing at about give or take 20 degrees or so. The issue here is that when I did this, there's a scoop in the upper, mm, I'd say upper mid range, lower treble region before the tweeter comes in. And that scoop just takes a lot of the attack clarity of dialogue. And it really just makes the speaker sound really laid back, I guess is the right way to use it. Now, with that in mind, I don't think it would be as big of a deal, but when that tweeter comes in, that tweeter comes in at about plus five, maybe even plus six decibels above that mid-range. And in my personal opinion, I think Focal should have crossed this tweeter over lower to match with the mid-range because as the mid-range is narrowing up, it's kind of trailing off in the higher frequency, and then that tweeter comes in, and it's just boom, and it overtakes you. If you have a room that has copious sidewall absorption panels, then that will help a lot. Otherwise, you can use equalization. I initially started out by using a tonal balance on my preamp and just adjusting a few things that way. But then I wound up using a mini DSP 2x4 HD to play around with EQ more. And I've got some suggestions that I'll provide you in a little bit when we get to the data. But suffice it to say, once I applied some pretty significant EQ to the higher frequency, I got these speakers to sound really darn good. But just keep that in mind. Now, if you're going to be using these for stereo listening without EQ, maybe you're against EQ, then you can expect these speakers to sound bright. I would say very bright. If you're going to use these for maybe home theater or you're going to use these for stereo and you're going to have equalization, then I think they're a worthwhile consideration because they have high sensitivity low distortion, and really good solid bass. Now you can't get away without using a subwoofer if you wanna get down to like 30 Hertz in room, but 40 Hertz in the room to 50 Hertz in the room is no problem for these speakers. Now, as I said, I started out with these speakers about three feet from the wall and I did move them closer to the wall. In doing that, I found the bass to be just a little bit too boomy. So then I took the mini DSP equalization and I brought down a couple peaks that were caused by my room. And after smoothing out that bass area and the upper mid-range treble region, I got these speakers to sound really close to what I typically prefer from a loudspeaker. Subjectively, one thing I do like about this speaker is there's a bit of a mid-bass bump between about 80 and 120 hertz. If you've seen enough of my reviews, you know that I talk about that in saying that it gives a little bit more weight, maybe a little bit more thump to the mid-bass region, even if the bass doesn't extend low, it will sound like it extends lower because there's a little bit more impact from that heightened area in the mid-bass region. In combination with that bit of a bump, there's also a little bit of a dip in the mid-range region. So the lower mid-range, and let's just say like around 200 hertz or so. So that tends to make male vocals primarily 
sound a little bit more subdued, I guess. And with female vocals, I didn't really notice that so much. So there's a little bit of a dip and then a, a peak there in that particular area that's going to make male vocals sound maybe a little bit more subdued. In terms of soundstage presentation, I like the speaker for the most part, but again, if I go back to the upper mid-range, lower treble region, there's the narrowing radiation pattern of that mid-range, and then there's the expansive pattern of the tweeter. In terms of soundstage radiation, I like the envelopment that this speaker provides. The only trick to that is that, as I said earlier, the mid-range tends to narrow up. When the high frequency comes in, it gets pretty broad pretty quickly. And in my opinion, it seems to be just a little bit too much of a discontinuity. However, I will note that as you transition from the mid-range to the tweeter, there's a smooth transition. So it's not all of a sudden abrupt in terms of radiation pattern. And we're going to see what I mean here in a little bit with the data. And speaking of the data, let's go ahead and do the sound clip and then we'll move on to the objective results. Now that you've heard the sound clip, this is what your ears were hearing. This is the on-axis frequency response in black. And you can see that there's a mild dip in the lower mid-range. Now you might have heard that, but more likely what you heard in this sample is going to be the lowering of the output as you go from the mid-range to the upper mid-range in this region, and then you hand off to the tweeter. That reduction in output is what I described as maybe laid back, lack of attack, lack of detail. Now this to me is probably more severe than most designs where I call this out. In most two-way designs and maybe even three-way designs, that dip is gonna be about one octave. So let's say about one and a half K to three K or two K to four K. But in this case, we can see that dip runs from about one kilohertz to four kilohertz. So that's two octaves wide and that's wider than I typically see even though I will say that the delta is about one and a half to maybe two decibels. In other cases, I've seen where that delta or that drop is three, four, maybe even five decibels in the crossover region. So while I talk about there being a lack of attack and clarity, it's not to the same magnitude as some of the other speakers where I've made the same comment because some of the other speakers are more significant in that reduction, but they're over a more narrow band. And then if you go to the higher frequency, you can see where the tweeter picks up and comes in. And for me, that tweeter is just too bright. So one thing you could try to do is to boost up the upper mid range a little bit. There's the capability of doing that. But then when you switch over to the tweeter, there's a little bit of a mismatch in the vertical directivity and the horizontal directivity. So you're going to want to keep that in mind around 4K. You're going to have a little bit more trouble EQing that up. But then if you go past 4K to around 5K or so, you can also then bring down the treble if you wanted to. F3 is at 50 Hertz, F10 is at 38 Hertz. So you'll get down to about 40 Hertz or so in the room. Sensitivity is measured at about 88.2 decibels. So you have pretty good sensitivity for a tower speaker here. Now, if we look at the CEA 2034 data set, we see the same information we saw earlier. Note that the listening window tracks the mid range pretty well in the on axis response. And the same thing with sound power and early reflections. So basically what we're seeing here is that while the on-axis response is doing some odd things, the overall directivity, horizontally speaking, isn't as bad as this data makes it look like. So when you break the components down, like I'll do in a minute, you'll see what I mean. This is the estimated interim response. See how significant this high frequency bump is here? Now, if I draw this line kind of indicating how I heard the speaker in my room, let's evaluate things based on that merit, okay? So interim extension around 45 hertz, 40, 50, 45, depending on your room and placement. This bass bump gives a little bit more thump in this region right here. I spoke about that earlier. Recessed upper mid-range and lower treble, giving you that laid back sound, lack of attack, lack of detail. And then here comes that tweeter is super bright and sibilant. Now, if the mid-range wasn't sloping down, then the tweeter wouldn't sound as aggressive as it does, but because that mid-range does slope down in nature and then the tweeter comes in, the tweeter for me is just too aggressive. 
But if I go apply some equalization that I came up with in REW, you can see that I take this black line, which is the estimated interim response on axis, and I bring that down to this orange line. And then I also take that black line and I bump it up about a decibel to flatten the overall in-room response out. And you can do this, and this is what I used to make the speaker sound more neutral in the room. However, I will say that when I did this, it took a good bit of the liveliness away from the top end. So if you like that characteristic, keep that in mind when you start EQing things and just pay attention to that, okay? Burst decay shows a couple little instances of extended decay. Horizontal contour plot. As I said, you have expanding tweeter and you do have decreasing or more narrowing mid-range through this region right through here. So as this red line decreases, then you have the tweeter come in and it's expanding more. Now you cannot fix this with just plain old EQ, 100%, but you can do a lot of things to help soften the blow from this. And also if you use and if you use sidewall absorption, you can also tamp down some of this higher frequency sidewall reflection and reduce the overall treble in your seated position. If we look at the vertical directivity, we can see that the speaker has about plus or minus 15 degrees, but it's still relatively tight. So I would stay within that tweeter axis as best you can. Harmonic distortion to 86 decibels and then at 96 decibels. And then if we go to multi-tone distortion, we see that this is also pretty low to the mid-range, although we have a spike here around 4K, but that's that dip from the mid-range to the tweeters. So that spike is actually filling in relative to the dip in response. If I use a subwoofer across this over 80 Hertz, not a lot of change here. So this implies to us that the components that are used are low in distortion already. The overall compression linearity looks good. There is this one standout area around about four and a half kilohertz or so where it might sound like a glare at really high volumes, but I don't think I'd worry too much about it. The impedance dips low to about 3.4 ohm. You're gonna want a good four ohm capable amplifier for this speaker, as well as keep in mind that the EPDR dips down to about 1.4 ohm, uh, even down through the mid range, you're at around two ohm or so. So again, four ohm capable amplifier is gonna be helpful here. Now, if we talk about the frequency response based on the amplifier that's used or the other way around, we can see that if you use a very high output impedance amplifier, you can have a swing of as much as two and a half decibels versus a better amplifier that has very low output impedance. So your common solid state amps are your really good class D amplifiers. If you use a, something like a maybe an older tube amp or maybe just a poorly designed tube amp or a set amp or even some poorly designed class D amps, but you'd have to go back a bit to get some of those, uh, then you could potentially run into some issues where you're gonna wind up with something like this where the frequency response changes in the black line to uh, the purple line. And you're looking at about two to two and a half decibels of change in the mid range. It brings that mid range down even more personally I'd go with trying to find an amplifier that has very low output impedance and you don't have to worry about swapping amplifiers around. So that does it for this review. I wanna thank Focal for sending the speaker out to me on loan to review. And if you guys have any questions, comments, or concerns, leave them in the comments section. If you'd like to support what I'm doing, you can join me at patreon.com or you can use any of my generic affiliate links in the comments section below. Using those will allow me to gain some commission off of whatever it is that you wanna buy. And I mean, anything that you buy through any of those links goes toward this website and what I'm doing here. So I appreciate it and I will talk to y'all later. Take care.